Let's turn today to Mark's Gospel and chapter 11 and verse 11. And Jesus entered Jerusalem. This is referring to the time when he rode upon an ass and people spread their garments on the road and those who went in front of him were crying out as we read in verse 9, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And Jesus entered Jerusalem and came into the temple and after looking all around he departed for Bethany with the twelve since it was already late and on the next day when they had departed from Bethany he became hungry and seeing at a distance a fig tree and leaf he went to see if perhaps he would find anything on it and when he came to it he found nothing but leaves for it was not the season for figs and he answered and said to it may no one ever eat fruit from you again and his disciples were listening the fig tree occurs right at the beginning of the Bible where Adam and Eve covered themselves with leaves from this tree after they had sinned in Genesis chapter 3 and it is a picture the fig leaves are a picture of human righteousness with which we seek to cover our nakedness, our sin. And we know that that is not an adequate covering for those leaves dry up and fall away. And we read in Genesis 3 that God took away those leaves and covered Adam and Eve with coats of skin. And the cursing of the fig tree here is symbolic of two things first of all it was a cursing of all human righteousness which with which man seeks to approach God and keeping with the type and the picture we read in Genesis chapter 3 the proper covering for man is the righteousness of Christ, that animals slain by God, the blood shed, is a picture of Christ dying for our sins. And his righteousness, clothing us, is symbolized in the animal's skin covering Adam and Eve. Secondly, the fig tree is also a picture of Israel. We read of God using that symbol in the prophets, The Old Testament prophets used the fig tree as a symbol of Israel. And Jesus spoke in relation to his second coming. In Matthew chapter 24, he said, one of the signs of his second coming would be the fig tree putting forth its leaves. In Matthew 24, in verse 32. And the cursing of the fig tree there is also symbolic in the sense that Jesus came to Israel looking for fruit but instead of fruit all he saw was religious form leaves that's not what he wanted and so it was cursed and we know that 40 years after Jesus death the Jews were scattered all over the world and they never came back to their nation until 40 years ago they never came back to Jerusalem until 23 years ago in 1967 in possession of Jerusalem and here we read that when the fig tree puts forth its leaves Matthew 24 32 it's an indication that summer is near even so when you see these things recognize that he is near the coming of the Lord is near right at the door And so we see that this fig tree that Jesus cursed has begun to put forth its leaves in our lifetime. And this is an indication of the soon coming of Christ. It also was used by Jesus, as we see later on, we'll come to that in a moment, to teach Peter faith, as we read in verse 20 to 22 of Mark 11. So it wasn't without purpose that Jesus cursed the fig tree 
There was deep meaning and purpose in every single thing that Jesus did. When we are immature ourselves, we often don't understand it. But if we can humble ourselves and seek God for light, we will find in every single action and word of Jesus, there's a depth of meaning. There are people who are foolish enough to criticize anything that they find in Scripture which they cannot understand. They do not understand it because of their immaturity or their carnality or their unbelief. But those who have faith and maturity and spirituality discover meaning in everything. Verse 15, And they came to Jerusalem, Mark 11:15, And Jesus entered the temple and began to cast out those who were buying and selling in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who were selling doves and he would not permit anyone to carry goods through the temple. And he began to teach and say to them, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations? But you have made it a robber's den. Again, we see Jesus doing something very drastic, which many people don't understand. He did not go to those people who were changing money and selling doves and speak to them gently, saying, Would you gentlemen please take your tables away or... Take your doves away. No, it says he overturned their tables and their seats. That appears to be drastic action. He didn't lose his temper. He never sinned. He did that deliberately. It was a, a deliberately thought out action. We read in verse 11. In verse 11 we read that he entered Jerusalem the previous day and came into the temple and looked all around and then departed for Bethany since it was late. What did he see when he looked all around on the previous day? He saw these very same money changers and the sellers of doves and he didn't do anything. He wanted to wait on the Father to seek for guidance as to what he should do. There may have been other occasions when he had come to the temple before this, when he saw these very same people doing this very same thing, and he never did anything. Jesus never acted on the spur of the moment. He never acted according to his own feelings. He acted according to the leading of the Holy Spirit. He waited on the Father, and he did what the Father prompted him to do. And when he was not sure, he waited. Even in Gethsemane, we read he was not sure of the Father's will towards the end of his life. He waited in prayer. That is a principle in Jesus' life, and a good principle for all of us to learn. To wait on God to know his will. And we read here that after waiting on God that night, he came back the next day and he knew exactly what to do. And he went into the temple, verse 15, and he had a clear direction from the Spirit what to do. He was not to gently ask them to move their tables. He was to cast out those who were buying and selling in the temple. He cast them out. And he overturned their tables. Imagine the gentle and mild Jesus doing that. Yes, there is a side to Jesus' character where he revealed the strictness and severity of God against sin particularly against those who seek to make money in the name of religion. What were these people doing? They were doing a good service. They were helping people to change the Roman currency into the Hebrew currency to drop into the offering box in the temple, a necessary service. They were selling doves for people who had to offer doves as sacrifice, a necessary service. And if they had only done that, that would have been all right. But they were doing it for a profit. And that was their sin. They were doing it for profit. They were not doing it out of love for the Lord. Now we can do things for profit in the marketplace, but not in the house of God. When you do things for profit in the house of God, Jesus calls you a robber. When you use your spiritual gift to make money and profit for yourself, 
Jesus calls you a robber. And you make your father's house into a robber's den. And we read here, this is why he overturned their tables and their seats. This is why he chased them out. He would not permit anyone to carry goods through the temple. He says, my father's house, my house shall be called a house of prayer. It is meant to be a place where people seek communion with God, not where people are seeking to make money for themselves. And as we look around at a lot that is called Christian work today, we can see that same spirit that pervaded so much of Christendom, where the Lord's work is done for personal gain and profit, in many cases for money, in other cases for honor and prestige and position. And if the Lord were to come today into all these setups, he would do exactly the same thing. He would turn these people out. And when he does come, finally, and sets up his judgment seat, that's exactly what he's going to do. Expose all these people who have used the name of Jesus, the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, to make profit for themselves. Verse 18 of Mark 11, the chief priests and scribes heard this and began seeking how to destroy him, for they were afraid of him, for all the multitude was astonished at his teaching. It was always the religious leaders who were against Jesus. The ordinary people responded. We need to be like those ordinary people to respond to his words. 